Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show, and I'm your host, Dr. Robert Lufkin. Rapamycin is arguably the most promising longevity drug currently available, and that is why we spend a lot of time on it on this podcast. Today, I'm going to share a 20-minute presentation on the subject that I gave at the recent RADFest conference last month. I've also included the short panel discussion after that, where we take questions from the audience. In that, I am joined by Liz Parrish, Drs. Greg Fahey, Bill Andrews, and Ian White. I do apologize to our audio listeners who do not see the graphics on the YouTube video version, but hopefully there will be sufficient value in the audio track itself to justify its inclusion on the podcast. Either way, please let us know so we can decide about future presentations. And now, let's hear about rapamycin. Our next speaker is Dr. Robert Lufkin. He has served as full professor at both the UCLA Dave Geffen School of Medicine and the USC Keck School of Medicine with a current academic focus on the applied science of longevity. In addition to being a practicing physician, he's author of over 200 peer-reviewed scientific papers and several books that are available in six languages. Let's welcome Dr. Lufkin on stage. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. It's, it's great to be here. I'm so excited today. What a, what a wonderful conference this is. And today I get to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is uh, rapamycin. Um, <laughs> before we do, though, let me uh, do a couple disclaimers. First of all, I am a practicing physician, so I'm a, I'm a medical doctor. So any, the advice that I'm about to give you should not be taken as medical advice, but rather as education only. Um, secondly, uh, the opinions that I'm expressing in, in a few moments are going to be my own opinions. They don't represent the institutions that I work for and have worked for at UCLA and USC medical schools. Um, finally, financial disclosures. Um, I sadly uh, don't benefit at all from the sales of rapamycin or any of its, uh, <laughs> its uh, products. I don't have a booth. Um, I, I'm doing this because I'm curious about longevity and I'm curious about rapamycin and it's out of self-interest for myself and for all of you that we can, we can understand this challenging area and hopefully improve our lives in the process. Um, in full, full transparency, I do receive some royalties from a book that was just published entitled uh, Lies I Taught in Medical School. And uh, in that book, it does discuss rapamycin and, uh, and longevity as well. Now, let's get into rapamycin. How many people in this audience, just out of curiosity, are currently taking rapamycin for longevity? I see a few hands, probably less than 10%. So um, let's, let's see how this plays out then. The origin story of rapamycin is fascinating. Uh, those of you who haven't heard it, I'll, I'll summarize it briefly here. It goes back, to, it starts in a remote tropical island that was literally thousands of miles away from uh, any major landmass. And because of the isolation throughout its entire history, Scientists believed that there were uh, going to be possibly unique organisms that grew there and um, unique uh, biological systems. That was all about to change, though, in 1964 when the first airport was planned on the island, which meant that literally thousands or millions of people would come in to the island and this unique environment would forever change. So scientists rushed there and they took soil samples from all over the island and took it home for analysis. And what they found did not disappoint. Uh, as um, suspected, they did find uh, several strains of unique bacteria that were unknown to science. But even more importantly, one of the bacteria secreted a compound that had unusual health and biological properties that had never been seen before. They named this, this compound that was secreted rapamycin, which was named after the island, of course, which is Rapa Nui. 
And uh, the, uh, the interesting thing about this, this uh, drug is its biological effects, and we're going to spend the rest of this presentation talking about them. But before we do, there's one other thing that this discovery of rapamycin led to, and that was it led to the discovery of the molecule that rapamycin acts on. In other words, the target of rapamycin, which is a protein which is arguably the single most important signaling protein in all of biology. Uh, to give you a sense of how important it is, it's present in almost all animal cells from yeast all the way up to human beings. And what, pur what purpose does this Tor molecule serve and, and rapamycin indirectly by affecting it? It's the ultimate function of any cell. It, it determines survival. And what does that mean? Well, rapamycin acts on this molecule, Tor, and Tor senses the presence of nutrients in the environment. And if it senses nutrients, if there's food, then Tor tells the cell to grow. And also, it stimulates inflammation because if there are nutrients coming into the cell, there's a risk of, of uh, foreign material, so inflammation has to be turned up. Also, if there are no nutrients detected, then TOR switches the other way, and it turns off cell growth, it turns off inflammation, and turns up a repair system that you, many of you have heard about already called autophagy. And this is basically what TOR does. It switches between growth and no growth, depending on whether there are nutrients present. And the type of nutrients we're talking about are um, primarily glucose, some branch chain amino acids also stimulate TOR, oxygen stimulates TOR, and then other signaling molecules, things like insulin or AMP kinase or IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor that some of the other speakers have already uh, talked about. Um, so this survival function makes sense. Uh, TOR, because if, if the switch moves incorrectly, the cell will die. In other words, if there's no food and the switch goes to uh, growth, the cell will die. On the other hand, if there is food but the cell doesn't grow, it's a missed opportunity. So TOR is uh, very important at a fundamental level for basically all cell survival. Now, the interesting thing for this audience, I think, is one of the most exciting theories of longevity and aging is the notion that at its most basic level, aging and longevity is driven by TOR overactivation. In other words, TOR is turned on too much. There's too much cell growth, too much cell proliferation, and too much inflammation. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is look at, test this hypothesis, see if it makes sense. We're going to look at published, peer-reviewed articles at phenotypes of aging, we're going to look at chronic diseases of aging, and then we're going to look at longevity itself and see if this, this theory makes any sense at all. Um, the uh, interesting way we can test this, of course, is that rapamycin, as, as we've said, works on TOR and it specifically turns TOR down. And so for longevity, if this theory is correct, we want to turn TOR down, and the drug rapamycin specifically targets TOR to do this. So the way we're going to investigate this in the next few minutes is we're going to see the effect of rapamycin given on a number of animal models and human models as well to see if this, this theory of longevity and, and TOR and rapamycin makes sense at all. Um, I should say that Rapamycin is available. It's FDA approved for other indications other than longevity um, in the United States, but it should not be taken except by, it's by prescription only, essentially. So you should have uh, a physician guide you if you're going to take this. So let's start with the phenotypes of aging. Let's just start with those and see if there's any effect. By phenotypes of aging, we mean the obvious things we all recognize, like gray hair, uh, loss of hair, uh, wrinkles, this sort of thing. And does rapamycin have any effect on, on these particular areas? This is, a, this is a scientific paper from 2019 using an animal model of, of hair loss, essentially, in the mouse. And the mice were treated with essentially rapamycin shampoo for 37 days. 
And what happened was, you can see in the picture there under the G, you have the control mice that still don't have the hair there, and then the rapamycin mice right below them have very rich hair growth. In the center graph um, there, you can see the flat line on the bottom is the controlled mice, and the line going up is the rapamycin mice, and that is a graph of pigmentation. So what we're seeing is evidence of the rapamycin, for whatever reason, is not only restoring hair growth, but it's increasing pigmentation, which may mean less gray hair. And finally on the side is an H&E stain, tissue stain, with the control on the top, with very few hair follicles, and then the rapamycin treated one on the bottom, and you can see those black structures are, are the hair follicles. So that's hair changes. What are the other phenotypes of aging? Well, the obvious one is wrinkles, right? Uh, as, as we age, our skin undergoes a number of changes. One of the most uh, basic ones, though, is the loss of collagen. And when collagen is lost in our skin, the skin becomes softer, it sags, and forms wrinkles. These are actually, this is actually human data that was um, uh, also from 2019. These were elderly people, volunteers, and they had rapamycin cream on one hand versus control cream on the other hand, and they put it on once a day for eight months, and at the end of eight months, these brave souls actually had punch biopsies of the skin of their hand so that we could look at the tissue uh, under the microscope. And what you see here is on the graph on the bottom, uh, that's a graph of collagen, and the left gray area shows low collagen in the controls, and then the right-sided uh, image shows rapamycin where the collagen is actually increased. And if you look at the histological specimens there, the placebo, you, where the arrow is pointing, you can barely see the uh, rapamycin, uh, you can barely see the collagen at the bottom, but in the rapamycin-treated ones, you can see that red line, which is restoration of collagen. Well, that's, that's hair and wrinkles. What else, what else can we look at with aging? Well, periodontal disease, as you may know, is strongly associated with aging. As we get older, older people, their, their teeth fall out. Periodontal disease um, is uh, increasing the space in the bone between the teeth and the, uh, and the gums and the teeth and the, and the bone. And this weakens the teeth and they eventually fall out. This is an animal model for periodontal disease, and you can see on the graph, the young mice have, you can literally measure the, the amount of bone resorption, or alveolar bone, as it's called, that's exposed. And the young mice have relatively little uh, exposed bone, so little periodontal disease. The adult mice have a little bit more, but when they turn into old mice, this periodontal disease increases exponentially, and you can see what it looks like there. What this study did was give a single eight-week treatment of uh, rapamycin to these uh, elderly mice, and you can see that the periodontal disease, the aging, as indicated by periodontal disease, was not only slowed down, but is actually reversed. So the periodontal disease improved in those patients. So we may see, um, we may see rapamycin toothpaste in our future, who knows? As far as the skin, also in the last one, the FDA a few months ago just approved the first formulation of rapamycin as a skin cream. Not for wrinkles, per se, but for another medical condition. But once it's approved, there may be off-label uses for this sort of thing. I'll end up with one last uh, phenotype of aging or sign of aging. And this is, this is a disease that all women get if they live long enough. Uh, and this is... Uh, ovarian failure, or commonly known as menopause. Um, now, if, if rapamycin and mTOR and this model of longevity works, as, as the theory says it does, it should affect all aspects of aging, including menopause. And this is an animal model of fertility in the mouse model. And we can see the blue graph on the top is the rapamycin-treated mice and the uh, red line on the bottom is the controls. And with rapamycin, we saw increased, um, uh, increased number of pups and a delayed onset of uh, menopause, essentially. Now, some of you are probably saying, well, this is great, um, but 
this isn't about longevity. Nobody dies of gray hair. Nobody dies of wrinkles. Nobody dies of menopause or periodontal disease. What are, the, what are the determinants of longevity? And that's the things that actually cause people to die. And it's no secret, they're, they're right here. These are the diseases of longevity. Things like heart disease, cancer, all that. And we can, we can look at rapamycin's effects on these and we see that um, the, the leading one is cardiovascular disease and that's narrowing of the blood vessels you've all heard about. When the blood vessel's like a pipe, when it narrows to the heart, it's a heart attack. When it narrows to the brain, uh, it's a stroke. It's possible to fix the narrowing by putting what's called a, a stent in there that mechanically widens it. But the problem with these stents is that the cardiovascular disease continues to, to go on and it recurs. What effect does rapamycin have? Well, one of the earliest applications of rapamycin is coating the stents because it stops atherosclerosis. It prevents the stents from recurring, and there are two FDA-approved applications for that. Let's look at another one, cancer. Um, cancer is, occurs in many different cells in our body, um, but the common feature that it all has is cell proliferation. mTOR, rapamycin, turns down cell proliferation. So not surprisingly, there are eight FDA-approved indications for rapamycin to treat cancer, all the way from metastatic renal cell cancer, which is the most common form of kidney cancer, to lymphoma, to, to others. So it works in this area as well. There's one last chronic disease I'll mention here, and that's, um, it represents the ultimate failure of our healthcare and research system. It's a disease that determines longevity and causes death for many people. But despite decades of research and literally unlimited amounts of funding, there have been no significant pharmacological interventions that have been developed that either treat the symptoms or slow the disease down. And that's, of course, Alzheimer's disease. This is an animal model of Alzheimer's disease with a mouse that uh, genetically gets the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And you can see in the picture there that um, the normal mouse, the WT wild type, has a certain memory function on the, on the left there. The Alzheimer's disease mouse in the middle decreases its memory function in the same area as the hippocampus that humans have. And when those mice are given two months of rapamycin treatment, the memory function, at least in this animal model, is, is restored. And this, this study just came out literally in 2021. There's now already a human trial underway for rapamycin in Alzheimer's disease. But you're probably asking, well, that's great. These are chronic diseases. These are phenotypes of aging. What about longevity? You haven't said anything about actual longevity. Well, longevity itself is tough to evaluate with humans just because you know, we live too long. But there are a lot of animal studies for uh, testing longevity. Perhaps the gold standard is the Interventions Testing Program. It's run by the National Institutes of Aging. Uh, and they just take two groups of mice. And uh, one mice, they let them live. Mice live less than three years. And then the other mice, mouse, mice they give them an intervention and uh, see if it works. They can be drugs or supplements and, and all. And the great thing about this study is in the 20 years that it's been going on, you can actually write in with your favorite supplement, your favorite uh, drug, and ask them to test it. And these are some of the things that the, that's already been tested. Resveratrol, metformin, MCT oil, curcumin, ashwagandha, um, green tea extracts, statins. Uh, if you're an NAD booster fan, uh, they, they tested nicotinamide riboside in there. Um, so how did this work? Did any of these result in improved longevity? Well, the answer is, um, in this group, no, they didn't. Uh, neither, neither of these um, resulted in improved longevity. None of these did. But there's a caveat. If the drug doesn't work in the ITP, it just means it didn't work at that dose. So there might be another dose where it would be effective. But still, the fact that they didn't, didn't work is, is concerning. Are there any drugs that did work? Uh, here are three. There are relatively mild effects that are sex-related. Acarbos is one we're going to talk about. It has a fairly large gain. It's a diabetes treatment drug that blocks carbohydrate uptake, sort of simulates ketosis or a, uh, uh, a low-carb diet. Well, 
These are mild effects. Is there any drug that reproducibly, reliably, consistently, and dramatically increases the lifespan in this model and every animal model tested? And of course, yes, it's, it's rapamycin. Here it is, we can see it there. Um, in uh, both males and females, it's a dramatic response. So I'm gonna end here. This is probably the question on all of your minds right now. Should rapamycin be taken for longevity? And the answer is, well, actually, I can't tell you because that would be medical advice. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, I can't tell you because nobody knows. It's, it's unknown. I mean, in this conference, we can't even agree on the model of aging and longevity. There are many different theories, and we don't really understand these drugs uh, at all, their effects. Um, there's exciting possibilities, but we still don't know. Just like you can't outrun a... a out exercise a bad diet, you may not be able to take a drug like rapamycin and make up for lifestyle. Things like, um, these things are changing very, very rapidly. For example, I'll end with this last paper on the bottom that it's from the ITP. It was rapamycin plus acarbose. Both of these increased longevity, but when they were combined, they gave a dramatic increase in longevity longer than either one individually, up to 35%. You have one minute. Thank you. And this, this paper just ended, in, uh, just came out six days ago. So this field is rapidly changing. There are a lot of dramatic things happening. I quoted a lot of my studies. All of these mice studies currently are now being applied to humans and the human studies in progress. So hopefully in a year we'll hear more about human studies. We can replace a lot of these. But I've never seen such a dramatic time in longevity with all the revolution of, of new information that we're getting especially with drugs like rapamycin and some of these other drugs that we're just beginning to understand. So I think for all of us, the future is bright and the best is yet to come. Thank you. Wow, 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 wow. This is amazing. I feel um, humbled and um, touched, moved by the work that you are all doing and so grateful that you exist and that you're saving our lives, saving millions and millions and trillions and countless lives. Uh, you've been sitting for a long time and quiet, so to celebrate this scientific progress that we're, being, that we're, that we're witness, uh, witnessing here, I want you to stand up and go, yeah! <laughs> yeah! Yeah! I'll do it too! All right. Well, we're going to uh, thank you for that. That is energizing. We're going to um, do our Q&A. Hopefully, I won't drop my iPad, and it will be OK. Um, so feel free to submit questions through the application, if you haven't done so yet, to this the event application on your phones. All right. Thank you again. Um, so I have one question for Liz. Is the BioViva gene therapy available for humans at an offshore clinic? Oh, that's a really good question. So outside of treating myself, um, through Dr. Williams, BioViva has never been able to treat a person because it's illegal for a U.S. company to do that. So we work with a company called Integrative Health Systems. They're an offshore company, and they're basically a company that connects patients to medical doctors, and you both consent to treatment, and then that's how you get access. Our company is able to assess the data, uh, but we're not able to give you a treatment. I'd like to change that. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Um, they want to know, Dr. Lufkin, if you take rapamycin, and if so, what effects has it had on you? Uh, personally, yeah, I do take rapamycin. Um, I haven't had any side effects from it. Uh, as far as the positive effects, it's very difficult to say because I'm, I'm like many of us, I'm doing a lot of different interventions with lifestyle and diet and fasting and other things. So it's, it, I, 
I feel great. I feel better than I used to feel, but I'm not sure it's the rapamycin. It might be a combination of other factors. So the short answer is I don't know. Do you do uh, any blood work or any biomarkers before and after? Yes. Uh, I, I, just, I routinely do biomarkers. There were no problems with glucose or any, there were no negative effects there or with immune function. And benefits in terms of any any of the biomarkers that we know of aging, for example, that you've seen changing? Well, all the, all the blood markers improved, but again, I'm not sure if it's what Which aspect one? of lifestyle and all the changes right. I'm doing. It's not a good way to run an experiment, yeah, exactly. but if not you're trying to save your life, it's a good way to do, do it. Do you take anything else other than, you know, your diet and exercising and it's, as, it's as like NAD or... Any other drugs? Or um, metformin and acarbose. Acarbose. Um, yeah, and there are so many questions, it's hard for me to choose one quickly, but um, I'll be right back, sorry. <laughs> I'm here. But, uh, um, so with the use of mRNA technology now, because of the COVID vaccine that is, is uh, globally being used, would you think this will accelerate the adoption of gene therapy? I guess it doesn't say who they're asking, but I don't know who wants to take it. I think it. I Bill know if, would if probably be good to answer I, that. We hope so. Yeah, let's That's see. My, okay, so I've done a lot of RNA work and a lot of DNA work, and I, I personally find that DNA works a lot better than RNA. <laughs> I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm guessing that that's probably what we're going to see. I'm, I'm not certain if RNA will ever take off, but RNA is faster. It's faster to get it developed in things, and so that's one of the reasons right. why it's vaccine. Any other therapies that you can think of here in the panel that could uh, advance faster because of mRNA? Well, I think that, you know, that, that was a, actually, if you want to look at anything <laughs> well, around the vaccine is, is that goes to show how fast the government can move if it wants to. Absolutely. Um, again, on the patient advocate side, um, you know, HIV had a drug in two years because people marched on Washington. And I can't tell you more that, uh, that that is really what we need to do. We need to get out there and we need to demand access because the regulatory system can move amazingly fast if they want to, and there's no bigger crisis than aging. Yeah. Oh, thank you. If, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to bring up a point related yes. to what Liz just said. There's a book that I'd like you all to know about, and I'd like you all to read it. Ultimately, it's called Death by Regulation by Mary Ruart. It, des it describes how uh, if not for a modification in the FDA charter that took place in 1962, drugs would be 40 times cheaper than they are now, and you'd have about 10 times as many of them, and they would have come a lot sooner, and there'd be no uh, compromise in either safety or efficacy. So. Um, uh, there are uh, uh, several approaches that can be used to bring down regulatory barriers, but it, there has to be the political will to go there. So if the public becomes aware of these things, maybe uh, you can influence other people. Yeah. That's right. Please read Bill Falloon's books as well, because he has done a, an immense amount of research also on the US FDA and how things really need to change. And I was just told that there's an amazing Joe Rogan uh, episode, three hours long. Yeah, if you really want to become uh, motivated uh, to do something, then I would recommend watching the Joe Rogan podcast that came out a couple of weeks ago. I was a scientific advisor on that episode. Um, it's three hours long, but you will not be able to tear your eyes away. It's about the insurance companies and about how uh, the healthcare system in the United States is really not, it's sort of let, it's let us down. But it's, it's amazing, I, would, I recommend it. Different, thank you for that recommendation. Yes, I think uh, science and technology are moving extremely fast and it's, it is accelerating, but the regulatory system is not moving as fast, so it's definitely not gonna work. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Ian, Dr. White, if you can tell us more about the Space Aging Research Institute. Yeah, so that's a new initiative um, that we're just starting. We're actually raising capital for right now. We're trying to raise $2 million for a two-year proof of principle research program uh, to demonstrate that some of these ideas about entropy being the ultimate cause of aging and how we could try to undo entropy that would then have downstream effects on everything else that we're studying here today. Um, so we want to be able to demonstrate that some of the ideas that, are in, that I describe in my book are actually based in legitimate science. 
um, you know, Schrodinger worked on them years ago. Um, uh, he ended up winning the Nobel Prize, but we've sort of forgot about, forgotten about a lot of this science, and we've also forgotten how to reconcile different disciplines. So I'm, I'm trying to do that. We're trying to get this institute going. So um, with your support, hopefully we can do that. Thank you so much. Is that a non-profit? It's a non-profit. It's a 501c3. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sounds wonderful. Um, question for, from Chase Falcon, Bilson. Um, for you, Dr. Fay. Would you expect the improvements you've, been, you've seen on PhenoH in various biomarkers to continue improving beyond your initial results if the treatments in these trials were repeated continuously, no gaps? It, it looks at the moment like what happened in the TRIMEX trial uh, was that it, it, with continued treatment it plateaued for a while. I think that that's uh, uh, an artifact of certain details of the way we did the experiment. I think we can overcome that. I have some pretty excellent leads on how to do that. But when that is over, then yes, I expect that the uh, plasma pheno age clock will go in reverse again for a period of time, just like it did in the volunteer that was in both Trim and Trim X. Uh, after the end of Trim X, he gained another three years of negative aging. So I think that that's generally going to be seen to, to occur. I don't have a good explanation for that, but uh, apparently there's further adjustments that the body goes through after the end of the treatment that allows it to get at least a transient further gain. So uh, I, I do believe that uh, that would happen. But if you continue the treatment longer, I think that it may continue to go down uh, farther and farther, uh, provided I make an adjustment to the protocol. Yeah. Yeah. Can't wait to see that. Greg, is there anything you want to say to women to sign up? I know you have less women participating. Is there yeah. anything in particular that you want to say to encourage them to? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think that uh, just for the women out there, just so you know, uh, the people that have been the most enthusiastic about this trial have been the women who have enrolled in the trial. Uh, they're just bursting with energy. They're excited. Uh, I think maybe women are built to live long, and uh, this treatment just sort of helps them do that. Uh, <laughs> So I would certainly encourage the women to sign up. It looks like you get the same benefits of the men, but you may have more fun along the way. So, uh, <laughs> For Dr. Lafking, are there known side effects to rapamycin, and did you say there was a rapamycin shampoo? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the rapamycin shampoo was what was used on the, uh, on the animal model. Yes. There's not currently an FDA-approved version of that. Can we still get some? But, uh, <laughs> biohackers are grinding fun. up tablets and making hand lotion and toothpaste wow. and shampoos, or, or they're just taking it orally. But it's all, you know, it's all the Wild West out yeah. there. You got my number, right? Pardon me? You, <laughs> oh, yeah. you, you you said there's an FDA-approved rapamycin cream? Yeah, it just came out for facial antifibromas associated with tuberous sclerosis. Um, so it's, it's, you could buy it. It's very expensive, but it's an off-label use for, you could use for hands, potentially. And if you're desperate enough, you could even put it on your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Dilute it with a little water and just rub it in. Right. There's a, a product here that has Rapalog that is a facial cream. I don't know if you... So, it, and, and part of my ignorance, but is, is it different than rapamycin, Rapalog? Here at this show? Yeah, this at the show, yeah. There's nope. a cream. I have, I'll, I'll check it out. I haven't uh, seen that. Is it, it Rapalog is different than rapamycin, or, or is, yeah, yeah. Greg is saying it is? Yeah. Okay. I mean, there, there can be all kinds of Rapalogs. Rapalog just so, means it's an analog to rapamycin. That's, so, but rapamycin is a Rapalog, correct? Uh, rapamycin is rapamycin, and a Rapalog okay. would be something that mimics rapamycin. I see. If it's chemically similar to rapamycin, the rapalogs uh, uh, will still be under the FDA approval and require a prescription to use them. Yeah, because I was talking to some people here and they were convinced that the cream was a rapamycin cream, but and that's mm. why this is the perfect, the yeah, perfect the, environment to <laughs> clarify that. Yeah, the cream, the hand cream is currently by prescription only just like the rapamycin tablets are. Right. Thank you. Um, Liz, what are your thoughts about using lipid nanoparticles as a vector for gene delivery as opposed to the CMV vector for gene delivery? 
Well, um, I'm interested in the lipid nanoparticles. Obviously, um, lipid nanoparticles were used in the immunization. Um, they, were not be, they were not able to be used in higher doses because they're toxic to your liver. Um, there are companies working on non-toxic uh, versions, but they have a long ways to go. And, you know, we looked at this uh, quite widely. We didn't start our research till 2018, three years into it. And, you know, we just like uh, vector delivery systems because they are designed to take genes and put them into the nucleus. And that's where genes have a persistent outcome. And so the idea of our company is to deliver drugs which you don't have to take over and over again. Although we did show that we may be able to create a, a intranasal uh, gene therapy for you. Hopefully that will also be long term. The idea is to make it so people are not dependent on uh, drug use, that we can kind of set it and forget it at least for a number of years, a decade or two. And I think that that's doing the best justice to the population. I've always said that right now we live uh, definitely in an economy where companies need to make money. In the future, uh, healthcare should be free and enhancement should cost a lot. And I want to enhance you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> How many, let me, uh, let me add to the nanoparticles. Um, it sounds like my mic, mic's not working. Uh, we've done a lot of side-by-side -side experiments, with mRNA, DNA, nanoparticles, viral vectors. We've never found anything that works as good as viral vectors. I mean, there would be a targeting issue with just lipid nanoparticles, right? Maybe the CMV has better targeting properties. Uh, can you? Yeah, I couldn't hear the, the end. Say it again louder. Say again what you said louder. I yeah, I mean, I think going to just a lipid nanoparticle it brings up issues of targeting, whereas the CMV has affinities for certain cells that you know in advance, and uh, well, you would have to build more into it than just the lipid coating. You'd have to CMV, you know, make sure AAV, it went the right adenovirus, place. CMV, adenovirus, lentivirus, all the other ones. We, we've compared side by sides with all those different viral vectors, and they all work better in our hands than, than nanoparticles. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Liz, how many therapies people can take from, of, you know, that you offer, that the BioViva is offering, and what kinds? Well, the BioViva, again, I have to say we can't offer therapies, but in medical tourism, there are many therapies available around the gene therapy space, both with companies we work with and outside of that. Um, you'll find a few companies working on uh, fullostatin, the muscle-increasing uh, gene therapy. You'll find clotho, clotho and uh, telomerase together for dementia or cognitive decline or cognitive enhancement. You'll find PGC1-alpha for obesity or metabolic uh, issues and then combinations thereof. And so PGC1-alpha and clotho um, and TERT may be a, a popular uh, in, uh, therapy for something like chronic kidney disease. And again, it's all experimental. If companies will work with us and share the data with us, we will get papers to you. And um, that's what we really push for. Um, thank you, Liz. Dr. White, um, you are the vice president of the American College of Regenerative Medicine. What, what do they think about aging and curing aging? Well, so the American College of Regenerative Medicine is a 501c6, and the idea there is that we're trying to bring together the entire field of regenerative medicine uh, to have some kind of standards, um, because that's really the, a big problem in the industry right now is that there are so many of us making great leaps, but then there are so many cowboys out there that are messing the waters. And so what we're trying to do is trying to bring everything under one roof to try to um, go to the FDA and say, look, there is some discipline here. We do know what we're doing. Um, and, you know, so... Anti-aging is part of regenerative medicine, uh, so we're a big proponent uh, of anti-aging. It's, it's going to be the rest of my life's work. Uh, hopefully, it's not going to take that long. I hope to have that for you in a couple of years, maybe 10 years. Uh, we'll see, but um, you know, that's why I, we have the American College. That's why we have the Space Aging Research Institute, that's because that's where I'm putting all my energy. This is the future. So they are, we're on the same page, basically. Yes, that's same page. Good. Well, unfortunately, we don't have any more time, and this conversation could go for hours, and I have a lot of questions from all of you here, but uh, I'm sure you can find... Are you all sticking around? Yeah? So try, you can have private conversations with them, and I want to thank you very much, very, very much, and for all the work that you do. Um, when when uh, I started, when I got involved in this field about 20 years ago, it was just a few of us 
crazy people with some crazy idea. <laughs> and, uh, and Aubrey the Grey actually was my mentor, and that's why I'm here. And um, I want to thank him too. And now this is a reality. There's an industry, there's a field, and it's just amazing. And I feel very touched by that and very grateful to all of you. And to all of you too, because without you, this wouldn't be happening either. Thank you. Thanks, all of you too. This is for general information and educational purposes only, and it's not intended to constitute or substitute for medical advice or counseling. The practice of medicine or the provision of health care, diagnosis, or treatment, or the creation of a phys physician, patient, or a clinical relationship. The use of this information is at their own, uh, own user's risk. If you find this to be on the value, please hit that like button to subscribe to support the work that we do on this channel. And we take the, your suggestions and advice very seriously, so please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you next time.